following is the lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter 5, Text 14, recorded on the 24th of June 1981, given by His Divine Grace, Srila Harakesh Vamin Vishnupad, at New Radakun, Sweden. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Shri Mad Chapter 5, Text 14 Nana Rupatmano Buddhi Svairiniva Gunandita Tanishtam Agatasyeha Kimasat Kamadir Bhavet Nana Rupat Mano Buddhi Nana Rupat Mano Buddhi Swayarini Vagunan Vita Swayarini Vagunan Vita Kanishtam Magatas Yeha Kanishtam Magatas Yeha Kimasat Kama Beer Above It Kimasat Kama Beer Above It Nana Rupat Mano Budi Swayarini Vagunan Vita Sanishtam Magatas Yeha Kimasat Kama Beer Above It Various Rupa, who has forms or dresses. Atmana, of the living entity. Buddhi, with intelligence. Svayarini, a prostitute who freely decorates herself with different types of cloths and ornaments. Eva, like. Guna Anvita, endowed with the mode of passion and so on. Tatnishtam, the cessation of that. Agatasya, of one who has not obtained. Iha, in this material world. Kimasat karma bhivavet, what is the use of performing temporary fruitive activities? Translation. Narada Muni had described a woman who was a professional prostitute. The Haryashvas understood the intelligent, understood the identity of this woman. Mixed with the mode of passion, the unsteady intelligence of every living entity is like a prostitute who changes dresses just to attract one's attention. If one fully engages in temporary fruit of activities, not understanding how this is act, how this is taking place, what does he actually gain? Purport. A woman who has no husband declares herself independent, which means that she has become a prostitute. A prostitute generally dresses herself in various fashions intended to attract a man's attention to the lower part of her body. Today it has become a much advertised fashion for a woman to go almost naked, covering the lower part of her body only slightly, in order to draw the attention of a man to her private parts for sexual enjoyment. The intelligence engaged to attract a man to the lower part of the body is the intelligence of a professional prostitute. Similarly, the intelligence of a living entity who does not turn his attention towards Krishna or the Krishna consciousness movement simply dresses like a prostitute. What is the benefit of such foolish intelligence? One should be intelligently conscious in such a way that he need no longer change from one body to another. Karmis change their professions at any moment. But a Krishna conscious person does not change his profession, for his only profession is to attract the attention of Krishna by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and living a very simple life without following daily changes of fashion. In our Krishna consciousness movement, fashionable persons are taught to adopt one fashion, the dress of a Vaishnava with shaved head and tila. They are taught to be always clean in mind, dress, and eating in order to be fixed in Krishna consciousness. What is the use of changing one's dress sometimes wearing long hair and a long beard, and sometimes dressing otherwise. This is not good. One should not waste his time in such frivolous activities. One should always be fixed in Krishna consciousness and take the cure of devotional service with firm determination. 
ज्ञान रूपात्मनो बुद्धि स्वयंनी व गुणान विता तनिष्टम मगतस्य ह किम सत काम बिबवत नारद मुनि हैड डिस्क्राइब्ड अ वुमन हु इज अ प्रोफेशनल प्रोस्टिट्यूट द हयाश्वस अंडरस्टूड द आइडेंटिटी ऑफ दिस वुमन मिक्स्ड विद द मोटिव पैशन द अनस्टडी इंटेलिजेंस ऑफ एवरी लिविंग एंटिटी इज लाइक अ प्रोस्टिट्यूट हु चेंजेस ड्रेसेस जस्ट टू अट्रैक्ट वंस अटेंशन इफ वन फुली एंगेजेस इन टेंपरेरी फ्रूट ऑफ एक्टिविटी not understanding how this is taking place what does he actually gain so the intelligence of a living entity is capable of attracting him towards different kinds of activities actually it is our intelligence which brings us to the platform of performing different activities there is thinking feeling and willing where from the more subtle platform the gross activity manifests so amongst the different parts of the subtle platform the intelligence is the most subtle most powerful of the subtle elements because it creates definite action at the present moment or the future moment but it creates the actions of the living entity the false identity this is a constant uh understanding which gives the intelligence the basis by which it will work according to our false conception of life that i am this body i am these bodily designations our intelligence will take the lead or will take uh will take the indication from the false identity as to which direction it should go because the identity is fixed of a living entity in his particular body this ahankara the intelligence thus takes that as a signpost pointing it in a direction and thus the intelligence works to lead the living entity his actions and even that which the mind is thinking leads him onwards in the goal to gain sense gratification through these temporary fruit of activities so this intelligence changes its form and changes its dresses according to that direction it is given by the false identity and thus the intelligence will manifest differently in different bodies because of that misconception of life that bodily misconception of life so the intelligence is constantly changing and thus constantly attracting us uh by this change of dresses just like it is stated uh that when we have a prostitute or a woman who is constantly changing her dress to attract a man you see they always change their dress they don't keep the same because they're wearing the same all the time not very attractive so therefore we change the dress in order to attract with the different forms of dress especially wearing less of it so the identity changing and the intelligence's thus determination is changing it thus attracts us the living entity who is of course being driven around by this you know the example of the body that the body is like a chariot the senses are like horses the mind is like the reins which the horses are controlled by the driver who is like the blind intelligence and the soul the living entity is sitting in the back unable to control this whole thing it's just going on wildly in the material nature so the <clears throat> living entities they are going from body to body through different species of life through different planetary systems and according to their activities they are suffering and enjoying accordingly and the intelligence is simply accepting different dresses in order to keep the living entity wrapped up in this material world to keep him addicted to sense gratification and this addicted living entity this addicted living entity he just uh keeps us 
acting fruitively for sense gratification. So what is the use of this? The Haryashas is saying. What is the use of such temporary fruit of activities which simply bring us more and more miseries as time goes on? We have to understand that this body brings misery and these fruit of activities which we are performing with this body bring misery and that even if we gain what is so-called success, that success will not bring us happiness. It's like if we gain fame, we gain profit, we gain distinction. These things don't bring us happiness. Because this world is not meant like that. This world is arranged for our various kinds of miseries on the fruitive platform. Just so that we learn. We learn that we're not this body, we're not this mind, we're not this false identity, we're not these senses which are dragging us here and there to see things to hear things, to taste things, to smell things, to touch things. These pullings, these are actually not us. That is why in the Upadesha Amrita Rupa Goswami describes these pushings uh, in as being uh, Vacha Vegam, Manasa, Krodha Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Etan, Upashta, Udhara Vegam. These are six pushing, which are the pushings of the uh, desire to speak. One is always desiring to speak. You will find amongst devotees there are those who just simply cannot control their tongues. Whenever there's an opportunity for joking words and saying anything, no matter how nasty or foolish it is, they will say it in order to engage the wicked tongue. The tongue likes to just speak any old nonsense. So, it just speaks. And this way, one gains great enjoyment on the mental platform for a few seconds. And then, he has to end up suffering all of the things he just said. <laughs> so, vacha vegam manasa, the mind. The mind is also thinking anything it wants, whenever it wants. Just like the mind is capable of just flashing all kinds of pictures in front of us anytime it wants. I've often given it as the, it's like a great photo file. And every now and then, the person in charge of the photo file, the mind, he just pulls out some pictures and sticks them in front of us and says, look at that. Don't you remember how you enjoyed that? Look at this. Isn't that enjoyable? And look at that. Don't you want to do that? And thus, the mind is constantly cheating us. The mind is like a cheater. doesn't care for us just whips out different pictures and cheats us in this way, cheats us in that way. And therefore the mind also can cause us so much trouble the way we think about other persons. When we think about other persons, we can think about them in very nasty ways sometimes. The mind cheats us because it just it has unlimited capability to think about anything. You see, there's nobody... It's like you can't just say anything. For example, if you just say whatever you like, sometimes you get in trouble. Sometimes somebody doesn't like it and beat you on the head. Or sometimes you get uh, some fine, or sometimes you get slapped in the face. Or You just can't say whatever you like, because as soon as you say whatever you like, you know, there are repercussions. But the mind, you can think whatever it like, because nobody's listening to it up there, we think, besides the super soul. The mind, there's nobody listening to it, so we've, we've given it, we're used to it, thinking whatever it likes, whenever it likes, because no one's looking. Of course, we don't realize the super soul is watching. But we have this uncontrolled, unrestricted mind, manasa. And because of all our attachments and frustrations, uh, we become angry. Kamesha, Krodesha, Rajaguna, Samudbhavaha, Mahasana, Mahapapam, Saram, Diri, Vayanam. Due to contact with lust, due to contact with the modes of material nature, and specifically the mode of passion, lust is arising. And when lust is unsatisfied, it always becomes frustrated. And then anger arises, wrath, Krodavagan, the pushings of wrath. And by becoming angry, one can destroy everything. One can be destroy everything. He can pick up things and smash them. Or he can start some fight and get his nose broken. Or by violence, people are destroying countries. They can destroy each other now very easily. So, 
Anger is another one of these pushings which are very bad. Just by great anger also one can curse others or one can act in such a way to destroy others. Just, be, just due to this wrath or anger. One has to control this also. Give it restriction. Not allow such anger to develop. And if it develops, one must control it by its intelligence. Just like Lord Brahma once became angry. But he controlled his anger by his intelligence. And that is also the devotee. He controls these things by his intelligence. Just like he controls his speaking by speaking about Krishna or Krishna consciousness or Krishna's service. He controls his, his uh, mind by engaging it always in Krishna's service. He controls his anger by becoming angry at, at non-devotees, demons, who are causing trouble to Krishna consciousness movement. He becomes very angry to them. And thus, he controls his anger. And anger must be there. You cannot avoid it. And thinking must be there. Talking must be there. You try to stop these things by some process of austerity, you will fail. Because one cannot stop thinking. Not for a moment. One cannot stop speaking. Of course, one can artificially stop speaking. You can take this Mona Vrata, where he won't speak anymore. But then he usually communicates with a blackboard and a chalk. <laughs> or with a pad and a pen. He writes messages to others. Because it is very difficult to live in this world without communicating. That is, that is what they do. These monobratis, they have, have a pad in their pocket with a pencil or a chalkboard. And they're always writing messages. So what is this? <coughs> if you stop speaking with the word, but then you're speaking through your written word. What is the difference? Why take such a brata if you're going to communicate? Actually, the brata is meant for giving up all communication whatsoever. Not communicating with other people in order to become free from all disturbances which arise from that communication. This is not our process. This is the Mayavadi's process. But the Monabrata is possible. Uh, of course, some who follow very strictly this mystic yogic process of one form or another, they will also accept that. And not necessarily for Mayavadi means, but nowadays, there's just the Mayavadis doing this. But what is the use? One must control the speaking, by using it for Krishna, one must control the mind by thinking of Krishna's service or engaging it in Krishna's service. And then there is the jiva, udhara, and upashta. These are uh, the three pushings that are on a straight line. The tongue, belly, and genital. If one is unrestrictedly attached to eating all kinds of wonderful opulent food, and tons of it. Then he pushes this down his throat and it fills up the belly, which becomes very full and thus the genital becomes very powerful and gains great strength and wishes to be satisfied. So therefore, a devotee doesn't eat just whatever the tongue wants to eat. The tongue will want to eat so many things. <laughs> By taste, there are things which often appeal to various ignorant classes of men. Just like they like to eat meat, they like to eat fish, they like to eat egg. You can, a devotee cannot imagine how anyone can like these things. Just he smells these things, he gets sick. But the materialists, they find these very palatable. And then they eat all kinds of horrible things besides this. In other parts of the world, they eat snakes, they eat insects, they eat eyeballs, they eat anything. I mean, there are things I can tell you about. I'm not going to tell you what they eat. Chiranjeev knows what they eat. <laughs> so they eat horrible, horrible things. Yes, yes. Children should be amazed that <laughs> people can eat such things. Ah, but they do. Because somehow or another, the mode of material nature has given them a certain kind of tongue which is attracted to these most horrifying substances. Uh, that if you want to eat any old nonsense thing, you can. And the mode of material nature will give you a body where you can eat these horrible things. If you desire to eat really wretched nonsenses, you can become a Chinese. And you can eat these horrible, horrible, wretched, 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 wretched things. Uh, or if one wishes, one wishes also to eat different kinds of spicy things. <coughs> 
just like they're always making this tamarind. But actually, tamarind is the most passion-producing substance in the history of mankind. <laughs> Therefore, one should not <coughs> eat too much, very little of tamarind. Horrible thing. And also, <coughs> too much chili. <coughs> too much chili also produces over, over amounts of passion, as well as onions and garlic. Thorakesh was telling me, this is Russian scientist has proven that onions and garlic produce all kinds of diseases of the, of the body. Therefore, they're trying to take it out of the Russian market, trying to get the Russian people to stop eating it because it causes all kinds of diseases. What do you know? So, uh, all of these things, horrible things, which also just ruin one's life, drinking of wine and beer and whiskey and anything which the tongue is a little bit attracted to, a materialist will immediately start to use. It's like the cigarettes. They can't give it up. They have to have something in their mouth at every moment. This pushing of the mouth is fantastic. They're always smoking cigarettes, and if they stop smoking cigarettes, then they're chewing gum like mad, or they're eating like mad. Uh, it's a common fact that if you give up cigarette smoking, then you become fat, because then you start eating like anything. So this is because the mouth has to be moving. They're either talking or eating. Uh, m modern people, they're either talking or eating or smoking or chewing. They're doing something with the mouth. Because the mouth is just such a violent thing. It's got to be always chomping and ripping and tearing and sucking and blowing. And all these things the mouth has to do to be satisfied. <laughs> so uh, then the, the stomach... The stomach is like a big empty pit. Sometimes we think the legs are also empty. One eats so much, he fills up somehow down the legs, both legs, up the stomach, all the way up to the neck. But <laughs> the, the stomach is like this big empty pit, which when it's empty, you begin to hear this growling inside. And then there's this growling, feed me, <laughs> demanding to eat. <clears throat> and then we have to pack up the stomach full and when it's all packed up and the stomach walls are just pushing to their maximum and screaming, stop, stop, then we consider stopping. So the belly has to be filled up also. And the genital thus, when it gets <coughs> all this power behind it, it says, now we're ready to act. Now we're really ready to go, come on. Now use me. And then one is dragged here and there all over the creation chasing after the opposite sex like madmen, trying to satisfy it. So, this material line of tongue, belly, and genital, it has to be conquered over for a devotee by, first of all, he only eats prasadam. And prasadam is food in the mode of goodness, except for two or three things which are in the mode of passion. <clears throat> like halva and kachuris especially. But, because Krishna likes them, we eat them also. So, uh, all prasadam is generally in the mode of goodness, unless the cooks put too much salt in or do some other horrible mistakes. And it is very purifying. One who eats prasadam, actually his body changes. The actual body changes. It is no longer run by these modes of passion anymore. Uh, no longer r mo run by ignorance. It is actually more on the platform of goodness, the body. You see devotees' body, they are very pure. They also glow. Devotees' bodies glow. All the police know this. If you want to find a devotee, just look for the ones with the bright, shining faces. Then you find the devotees. They know. In the, in, in the malls, when they're distributing books. If you want to find them, just look for the ones with the bright, shining faces. Because the body changes due to the fact that of eating prasadam. There was one famous man, he said, you are what you eat. That is a fact. When you eat prasadam, then you become spiritualized, Krishnaized, because prasadam is Krishnaized. Prasadam being offered to Krishna, Krishna accepts it, and by the contact of Krishna, the prasadam becomes contacted by Krishna, and thus, it becomes purified and transcendentally surcharged. And therefore, one who takes, he becomes purified. Therefore, when one eats prasadam, 
The tongue becomes satisfied. And devotees, they know. You take something which is unoffered, you're never satisfied by eating it. And you take something which is offered to Krishna, you're satisfied. Now, if you take something which is offered to Krishna with love, and intense love and devotion, it begins to taste like the nectar of the gods. One can't imagine how good it is. If somebody who's cooking, cooks with love and devotion for Krishna, Krishna will take that with such relish that that prasadam will be so powerful. That prasadam will be so powerful, it will just completely absorb the tongue and the consciousness and one will become ecstatic eating it. Yes, there are actually three... I, we have heard from authorities. There are three kinds of prasadam. That which is in the Prakrita class, the Kanista class, the Madhyama class and Uttama class. So according to the consciousness of the cook, the cook is a Prakrita bhakta, then the food doesn't get so much spiritual oomph. And if he's a Madhyam bhakta, much more, an Uttama bhakta, then it is like absolute ecstasy. And we have had the opportunity to take feast cooked by Prabhupada and you cannot imagine <laughs> The difference <laughs> when just ordinary Prakrita Bhakta cooks and when pure devotee cooks. There's such a difference. One will bring you to the spiritual world immediately. Such prasadam will immediately transform one to the spiritual world. That is a fact. So, when one takes prasadam like that, then the tongue is fully satisfied and one doesn't even have to eat too much. It is not that one has to pack up the stomach we have seen that when the food is not very nicely cooked, to get satisfaction, the satisfaction is simply on the platform of the belly. And thus you have to pack up the belly until it is sticking out ten feet. And when it tastes very good, then you're satisfied with so much less. One is satisfied with so much less. Uh, because then the satisfaction comes from the platform of the tongue. It's actually quite scientific. Uh, when, when the satisfaction is on the platform of the tongue, then you don't have to eat very much. And when it has to come on the platform of the belly, then you have to pack up the belly, because the belly is only satisfied when it's all packed up. And of course the genital, that is never satisfied. No matter what you do, genitals are never satisfied. It's the most amazing thing. Just like tongue is never satisfied, genital is never satisfied. You can go on having sex day and night for centuries, and one will never be satisfied. Because that is the nature of this material disease. Everybody has this material disease. We've all come to this material world in order to taste that rasa. That is one of the, that's called the adi rasa. Where one is simply enjoying the sex life and various forms of life. All these different animals, birds, beasts, whatever. Everybody's enjoying sex life in different forms. Even the flies. It is nothing new. There's nothing new for any living entity. Every living entity simply lives for such sex enjoyments. But actually, these things, they are simply causing one misery. The more one is engaged in sex life, the more one is miserable, especially in Krishna consciousness. If one who is supposed to be Krishna conscious householder falls down into illicit sex life, he has practical experience, that his life becomes absolutely miserable. He can have no happiness, no peace, no enjoyment, no freedom from miseries. He's just suffering again and again and again. So therefore, one has to be very, very strict in these regards. That is why Prabhupada also says in this purport, just like because the dresses is mentioned here about changing dresses, one should be very strict and not just keep changing dresses. Uh, not just one should be very attracted to wearing fantastic clothing or very uh, nice materialistic kind of clothing. And uh, the people they ask in the programs, why do you have to change your dress? Because they're very attached to keeping very fantastic dress. So they can attract people for sex life. Of course, we don't mention that directly in programs. <laughs> but they're always complaining like that because their whole purpose is to attract others for sex and therefore they wear these fantastic dresses. But a devotee, he's only got one kind of dress. <coughs> and therefore, there's none of this consideration of attraction. None of this consideration of attraction uh, by changing your dress. I mean, after all, who's going to be attracted to this kind of dress? <laughs> all crinkled. 
And therefore, there's none of this consideration of attraction. None of this consideration of attraction uh, by changing your dress. I mean, after all, who's going to be attracted to this kind of dress? All crinkled. <laughs> well, that's very good. You see, we're not lamenting that. <laughs> In this way, we stay very peaceful. So, this fashion, the Vaishnava fashion, <coughs> is a fashion of serving Krishna. Actually, this is the whole fashion. The fashion is just to serve Krishna. So, by doing so, <coughs> then this whole intense, uh, attitude of simply living one's life for sex life, that is reduced. And thus the genital becomes more peaceful, actually becomes controlled this way. Because when one doesn't pack up his stomach, when he just is satisfied with prasadam, whatever comes of its own accord, then one is actually quite peaceful. One is actually quite peaceful. We don't have around here midnight raids on the refrigerator. I don't think anyway. <laughs> Uh, I'm right, aren't I? Okay, we don't have <laughs> midnight rays in the refrigerator. We're uncontrolled tongues and bellies force one to go in and just start stuffing. <laughs> no. no. We actually are quite satisfied with whatever Krishna provides, whatever little Krishna provides. Simple living, high thinking. The intelligence of a materialist, he's not interested in simple living. He's interested in living as complicated as possible in order to gain as much sense gratification as possible. But a devotee is simple. The simple doesn't mean he's a simple ton. It means he has no brain. No, he's not simple in that regard. He's simple in that his requirements are simple. His desires are simple. His activities are simple. He simply requires a little food, a little place to sleep, a little a few clothes, nothing more. He doesn't require more. A clock, <laughs> a toothbrush. What more does a devotee need? He's simple in his living and he's simple in his desires. He just wants to serve Krishna wherever, he's, wherever he is, however he can. And simple in his thinking because he's just got a single purpose. Vyavasatmika bhuti ekeha kuru nandana. He's just got the purpose of single-mindedness. He just wants to serve Krishna. Now, the materialists, they think there's something wrong with that. Because of bhogai shraya pasakanam taya prahita chetasam vyavasayatmika buddhi samadhao na vidyate. They never have any peace because their intelligence is many-branched. In a single person, you will see the intelligence of a materialist splayed out in ten different directions. Therefore, he's never fixed up in his purpose. Because his intelligence is splayed out like a shotgun. It's going in all directions. Therefore, he doesn't concentrate in any one particular area. Specifically for self-realization, it never occurs. Or peace, it never occurs. Because he's got so many plans. It's like when you're cooking and you have too many pots on the stove at one time, you get confused. And no preparation comes out really perfect. Of course, if you're a really good cook, you can do that. Some good materialist might be able to do something like that. But they never are peaceful because of it. <coughs> the purp purport of that verse is they never attain peace because of it. Samadhao navadiyate. Because they're just agitated. They're doing these things out of agitation to just stir up the material world more and more, trying, searching to squeeze out some sense enjoyment by doing a million different things. But they're never peaceful. Neither happy. Neither do I get out of this entanglement of maya. But a devotee has got a single-minded purpose. That doesn't mean he doesn't cook with many pots on the stove at once. A good cook, he can also have 30 preparations going on at once. But it means that he's got a single-minded purpose to act only for Krishna. Not that he's sometimes thinking about all these other directions in which to go, confused how he's going to satisfy himself or his friends or his family or society or his... You know, humanity or whatever. Devotees have a single-minded purpose to please Krishna and thus all other purposes are fulfilled automatically. It is not like we, ha we are pinheads. They think we have just one, one idea only. But because of that idea, all other ideas are fulfilled. All other ideas are fulfilled. That's why people are so amazed when they come here. They see so many things are going on. A few people are doing so many things. 
printing so many books in so many different languages, distributing all those books, making records, selling records, making TV, making radio shows like anything, newspaper articles coming out like anything, and, and doing all these things, school programs and, and these materials you're giving to schools and everything, doing so many things, paintings everywhere. They're just amazed. Farming going on. Every inch of ground being used somehow or another to grow something. They're just astounded. Cows walking around mooing, kids running, schools, fishes swimming in the pond. <laughs> Everything is amazing to a materialist because he can't imagine how so many things can be going on yet people are so single-minded just serving Krishna because they don't realize that serving Krishna means you can do everything in this creation that's not Maya for Krishna. And thus, a, a normal person, materialist, can't imagine how with such single-minded purpose so much variety is there. Whereas they're just splayed out in their purpose to make so much variety, yet they're not accomplishing hardly anything. They're not accomplishing anything at all, as a matter of fact. You go to any other group of people, you don't see them doing anything, practically. Or they may grow some food and may make some clothes. But all these other expanded projects are just far beyond their comprehension. So, Krishna consciousness is actually a very wonderful thing. It's a very wonderful thing. Everybody should be very attached to it. You should see what's right before us. Sometimes we don't see the gift of Krishna consciousness. We don't see how nice it is. We don't see how exciting it is. Because we become confused by material sense desires. We become completely confused sometimes. We don't see how wonderful it is that which we have right in front of us. The most amazing thing in the world is here. Ah. Whereas the materialists, they're just astounded. See, because, but we forget what it's like to be a materialist. You know, actually, you should remember that you forget what it's like to be a materialist. Which is good, of course. We want to forget what it's like to be a materialist. But one should remember that actually, there's just so many miseries of this material world. We should keep in mind what it was like to suffer as a materialist or how useless life is, or how little one can actually accomplish, and how little satisfaction it actually brings him. One should remember that. Now and then. Not all the time. Because we don't want to be constantly involved in just negating the material miseries of life and thus developing our spiritual conception. But now and then, we should at once a day at least remember what a rotten place this material world is. Yeah. Of course, we can remember it more often if we're always using that as an impetus to surrender to Krishna, to more and more surrender to Krishna. But it's also a problem sometimes devotees, they're just thinking about, oh, Maya, this horrible Maya, oh, these horrible women, ah, yes, horrible bodies, they're so attractive just to drag me to Maya, yes, so attractive just to drag me to Maya, yes, just to drag me to Maya. Okay, let's go. So one should be very careful to avoid that trap also, that pitfall also, of becoming attracted to something through the negation of it. This is the problem with the Mayavadis, by the way, that they're always negating Maya, pushing Maya away, pushing Maya away, pushing Maya away, but actually they're totally absorbed in Maya. That's why they're called Mayavadis. Because they're saying, not this Maya, not that Maya, not that Maya, not that Maya, not that Maya, but all day long all they're saying is Maya, 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 Maya. Material world, material world, material world, material world. Therefore, they never get out of the material world. They're completely attached to it. Totally. Because everywhere they're saying, not this, not this, not this. They're attached to all those not this. Is. That is a fact. The present Maya bodies. Therefore, they just are staying in Maya forever. So, one should also not fall into that trap. But we should always reach out for the topmost level or the higher levels of Krishna consciousness. Reach out for the bliss of Krishna consciousness. Reach out for the satisfaction of devotional service and serve more and more, more and more determinedly, more and more enthusiastically. And thus, we will become free from all of these miserable conditions of Maya and the material world. And the intelligence will no longer act like a prostitute. Yeah. Or another example is just like a bullfighter. You know, the bullfighter, he takes this red cloth like this, he hangs it there. Then the bull comes charging, and then he goes... Shh. So the intelligence is like that. It's just making a thinly veiled illusion for us. And then we go charging at some sense gratification, and it pulls it away, and we bash into a wall. 
and then the intelligence does it again. Of course, the intelligence doesn't mean to cause us all this trouble because it's not very intelligent. It thinks there's real enjoyment there. But its main function is to attract the living entity in different directions. But because there's not real intelligence there, we get in an awful lot of trouble. Intelligence is not responsible for itself because it hasn't full knowledge. Therefore, in spiritual life, we take shelter of a spiritual master who becomes our intelligent direction, who becomes responsible for us and thus directs us now, not in a way in which we bash into a wall, but in a way in which we can go further and further in devotional service. Therefore, we should not trust our own intelligence because our own intelligence is not responsible. It is not a responsible thing, but spiritual master is responsible. Therefore, we do not trust our own intelligence, but we trust the intelligence of spiritual master. <coughs> so, this is uh, the secret of attaining success in spiritual life. And if we can just understand this, that our intelligence is like a prostitute who will go in whatever direction gives us the most enjoyment, then we should become very serious to engage in devotional service as we are being requested by spiritual master, and then we'll be very happy. So, are there any few questions? Yes? In different bodies. For example, the false identity. Ego meaning identity. So now you have an identity. Your identity is of your particular body. And the ant has its identity of its particular body. It's different, isn't it? Now the fact that it's, that it's I'm this body, yes, you're right, it's all the same. Everyone has the same conception that I'm the body. But the particular conceptions within those bodies, that's what I meant, that's different. Sure, the consciousness. The consciousness comes from the soul. And that is manifested through this body. So it's that which you are attracted to. But you cannot perceive it purely because it's all perverted and polluted. Yes, you can say like that. But that is a remote cause. That's a more remote cause. Do you remember I went through this thing about direct causes, remote causes? So that's a more remote cause than the specific causes which are more direct which cause a person to act. It's like when your foot falls asleep, you move it. So you can't say that your consciousness is causing that directly. Of course, indirectly, because you're feeling the pain. Okay, so you, you move your foot. But I mean, directly, you cannot say that this is a direct function of the consciousness. Directly, it's a function of the floor in your foot. And the function of how the foot feels pain, which the mind perceives, etc. And so we get deeper, 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 deeper. There's the consciousness. So it's a remote call. You read my Vyas Puja offering of last year? And so there I explained the whole thing about just offering words of praise like dry crackers falling out of a box. They don't please anybody. They just fall out of the mouth like dry crackers falling out of a box. It's not very pleasing. One has to offer it with some juice there, you know? Bhakti means it comes from the heart love and devotion it's not parrot repetition parrot repetition will get you somewhere like the parrot when he's squawking everybody looks at him and goes ah look how nice but that's not the real thing the real thing comes from the heart therefore offering just prayers like that doesn't really help but if you had some sincerity <laughs> then you should use that sincerity to whatever degree you've got it as sincerely as possible to, to offer your prayer or request or whatever. It must come from the heart though for it to really be effective. Yes, the main form of purification process. It is not exactly prayer. In fact, we never would call it that. It's uh, actually a mantra delivers the mind away from its present material engagement, entanglement and brings it to the spiritual platform and purifies us entirely. So it's not just prayer. We're not asking for anything except for the possibility to be engaged in Krishna's service and thus become purified. Like what he was saying? Yes, that is a function of uh, a communication between the living entity 
and the Supreme. In devotional service, it's a communication. It's not just a gimme prayer. Like, gimme this day, gimme my bread, and give me, uh, don't lead me anywhere where I shouldn't go. And if I do go there, you better forgive me. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Very good. <laughs> yes, that's real love. Real love means service. You cannot speak of love unless you speak about service. Otherwise, it's just business. I give you some good words, you give me so many facilities. It's flattery. But one should render service <clears throat> without expectation of return. That's the highest principle. What, what was that? Uh, Subtle growth? Yeah, uh, uh, the from, from, from the uh -huh, okay. Yeah. That's not subtle growth, that's finer growth. There's yeah. a distinction. From the more subtle to the more, to the less subtle. Yes. Yes. Everything comes from the most subtle point. The desire of the living entity. And from that, the false ego is developed. From that, the intelligence is developed. From that, the mind is developed. From that, the ether is developed. Air, like it's going down like this. Always that process. From the more subtle to the less. To the most growth. False identity makes you think you're that body. That's that false identity. That's not making you think so much that way. You actually want to think that way. And as soon as you stop wanting to think that way, then you will stop thinking that way. But when you are thinking that way, that's called false identity. False ego. Ego means identity. Not very good. It's got the thumbs down from the higher authorities. It's like the, in the gladiators, you know, they, you know, in the Roman times. Why not? In various ways, in stages, gradual, some less gradual, and some more gradual. So we're trying to make a build up <laughs> to meet the breakdown and bring it this way. <laughs> All right, Hare Krishna.